even in the best cases, uh, Japan and Switzerland, two or three percent inflation will eventually erode the value of your money ninety percent, given enough years. Which is a better form of money, gold, fiat, or Bitcoin? Our sponsor offers both Bitcoin and gold if you'd like to open a retirement account with either option. iTrust Capital is an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and physical gold and silver. iTrust offers 1% trading fees, the lowest in the crypto IRA space. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or row over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David to learn more and get started. Our next guest joins us now. He is Lawrence White, professor of economics at George Mason University. Lawrence is an expert on monetary policy. His research is published in many uh, papers, including the American Economic Review and the Journal of Money. And, of course, we'll be discussing his new book entitled Better Money, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. Professor White, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Good to be here. Let's start by talking about uh, the question on everybody's mind, is inflation over? Before we talk about fixing inflation, let's address what's currently happening now. We've had a significant decline from its peak. I'm talking about headline CPI, of course, 9.1%. Recent tick up uh, from the uh, beginning of summer due to mainly higher oil prices. Is inflation going to be stickier around 3.7% or do you think it'll go higher or perhaps much lower? Well, it all depends on Federal Reserve policy. They drove it up to 9.1 through uh, an easy policy back in 2020, 2021, which at the time was appropriate, but they didn't pull the money out fast enough. Uh, And so we got up to 9.1%. And as you say, uh, inflation has been declining since then. It's still not back to the target of 2%. Uh, much less is it uh, close to zero, which was the experience under the gold standard. So uh, whether it, it's not permanent under our current set of institutions, it's only it will be whatever the Federal Reserve chooses. So when you say it's dependent on what the Federal Reserve does, do you mean to say that in order for them to see core PCE down to their 2% target, they would need to raise rates even more? Is that what you're saying? Well, they need to slow money growth, which is associated with raising rates. That's usually the way they describe their policy. But uh, it's a kind of a loose connection between money growth and uh, interest rates. So what you're saying is there there could be a way for them to tame inflation without raising rates even further. Can you just can you explain that? Yeah, a quantitative tightening. So they they've been doing that they had m2 has been shrinking so that's brought inflation down okay do you, do you believe then that the m2 growth was the largest contributor to the rise in inflation that we've seen in the past yeah absolutely okay now well, the federal reserve so there were of course two things going on during the pandemic sure. there was uh, rapid money growth but there was also shrinkage of real output so those two things together contributed to inflation but the shrinkage in output is over, so now it's all on monetary growth. Absolutely. Well, recessions are usually in the past deflationary, enough, if not just disinflationary events. The Federal Reserve, however, is not projecting a recession uh, anytime soon, even in 2024. Do you agree with that outlook? No. I mean, we've been running over normal capacity. right? The Fed estimates sort of the sustainable level of output, uh, full employment level of output or potential GDP, they call it. And we've been running above that. So we're due to kind of move back down to a sustainable level from an overheated economy. Okay. Now, uh, what about this prospect of stagflation, which is the idea of we have high inflation or sticky inflation, but low economic growth. Now, as I said, typically we've seen inflation come down during a recession, but could this time be different? Well, we haven't seen a real revival of economic growth. Uh, Over the last 10 years, it's averaged about 2%. Before that, it was 3%. So we haven't, that's real GDP growth. So we are in a stagflation by that measure. Um, but when people say stagflation, as you said, it's inflation together with sluggish growth. 
And it's possible to have sluggish growth with low inflation or with high inflation. Okay. So now let's move on to talking about monetary systems that may prevent inflation from occurring again to perhaps high single digits or or even low double digits. Now, if you take a look at the historical inflation rate, uh, it has been relatively stable post uh, post uh, the beginning of Bretton Woods until 1971, people would say, "Well, that was you know you put two and two together. That's probably because of the um, the system that we had, which is the gold standard Bretton Woods." I'm talking about. Was there is that just a correlation? Was that causation? So the the key to controlling inflation is to control money growth. And for a while, the Bretton Woods system, because it anchored the dollar to gold at $35 an ounce and the Fed respected that constraint, the Fed kept money growth moderate in order to be able to meet its obligations under Bretton Woods to redeem the dollar uh, for gold at $35 an ounce. So at some point in the 60s, they stopped being constrained by that. Money growth began to rise, inflation began to rise, and the shutting of the gold window was a symptom of that. It was because we had had high inflation for several years, in the late 60s, it was up to 6 7%. Uh, that made the dollar lose purchasing power relative to gold. And so the foreign central banks, the European central banks that had the right to redeem dollars for gold, said, now's the time to do it. And the US Treasury was about out of gold when they finally shut the gold window in 1971. So that's the connection between the two. It's in principle possible for the Fed to control money growth appropriately, even without a gold anchor. They just haven't done it. They haven't consistently kept money growth to a level consistent with low inflation. There was a period, the so-called great moderation, where they were doing pretty well, but that's over now. I believe Switzerland has in their constitution a, a mandate to have either um, a certain budget deficit level relative to GDP or spending constraints. Is that what we need in this country, just hard spending constraints built into the constitution? Well, that would help. I mean, you can control money growth without them, but in, especially in countries with high inflation, the reason the central bank is printing so much money is that the national government comes to the central bank and says, we have bills to pay. Please print the money to enable us to pay the bills. I don't know if you saw the story about Ghana in the news today, but they've got 40 to 50 percent inflation now. And it's directly because the central bank has been prevailed upon to print money, lend it to the central government, which then didn't pay it back. <laughs> so there is a connection to fiscal policy uh, in cases of high inflation, most definitely. Well, what, what's Ghana going to do in this uh, in this particular example? Uh, it's a good question. I, if I lived in Ghana, I would move my wealth out of the local <laughs> currency and into something more stable. Right. Okay. So, what you're saying is the government needs to control money supply to 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 in order to prevent higher inflation. So then, how? The question is, how do they control money supply? Right. Um, is the gold standard the optimal solution to achieving this how? So you could say there are two approaches to trying to get better monetary policy. One is to give the central bank advice, and we've been doing that for a couple of generations now, and not always effective. The other approach, which I think is more serious and more likely to succeed, is to put constraints on the central bank. The gold standard is one kind of constraint. In fact, with the gold standard, you can do away with the central bank because you don't need a central institution to control the quantity of money. The, the gold market does it automatically. There are alternatives that are uh, would be a little less, I don't know, radical, which would not require uh, shutting down the Federal Reserve, <laughs> putting some kind of quantitative rule on the Fed. Um, a money growth rule or a money growth rule with feedback or a nominal GDP rule, provided these rules were really enforceable and really had teeth, they would constrain the Fed not to issue more money than is appropriate. That, that was my next question, whether or not such a constraint would also constrain real GDP growth. Is there like a fine line or a balance we have to tread? 
No, uh, it wouldn't constrain real GDP growth. Now, monetary policy can disrupt real GDP growth if it's either too expansionary, because then you get a high inflation and that disorders the economy and countries with high inflation struggle to grow because price signals are scrambled, the economy is chaotic. Or at the other extreme, uh, if the central bank tightens money too much and unexpectedly, uh, that can force a recession through a unsatisfied demand for money. People are trying to sell goods in order to accumulate money, but if everybody's trying to sell goods and nobody's trying to buy goods, then you get a surplus of goods corresponding to the unsatisfied demand for money, and then you have a recession, right? Unsold inventories, output declines. So let's talk about your book now. You describe systems of money, and you pose a question, which I'll ask to you, a sensible question, <laughs> which is a better form of money. How do we define better, first of all? How, well, well, what's your definition of better? That's a good question. So I approach it from the point of view of the ordinary user of money and say, what would the ordinary user of money want in a money? What, would, what to them would be a better money? And I think the answer is a money of a more stable, more predictable purchasing power. So not a money with high inflation, not a money where the price level drifts unpredictably, but something like, I, mean, I think the best historical example we've got is the classical gold standard where inflation wasn't zero every year, but if prices started to go up, there was a better chance of them coming down again than of them continuing to go up, just because of the economics of gold mining. If the purchasing power of gold starts to fall, which is what happens in an inflation, it discourages gold mining. And so the money supply grows more slowly until you're back on track and vice versa. If uh, the price level starts to droop, that makes it more profitable to mine gold and that'll bring prices back up as the quantity of gold expands. Now you can try to replicate those properties in a fiat money system. We just, and Gr Alan Greenspan used to say that he was trying to emulate what the gold standard would have done, but uh, he didn't really manage it. And we haven't seen any fiat money systems that have given us the zero inflation rate on average that the classical gold standard gave us. So you're your book title is, once again, Better Money, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. Let's talk about all three of these. Starting with fiat first, I've heard this statement a lot from other economists, and I've read this on social media and online as well, the notion that all fiat currencies historically have all depreciated by at least 90% over time. In other words, fallen to zero over the course of its history. True or false? Well, not uh, over a long enough timeline, that's right, because they've all had positive inflation rates, which means the currency unit is losing value uh, every year. Even in the best cases, uh, Japan and Switzerland, 2 or 3% inflation will eventually erode the value of your money 90% given enough years. <laughs> Uh, well, well, so so, so I guess the question is, um, yeah, that, that makes sense. So the textbook definition of money, and you can disagree with this if you like, is that it has to be A, a medium of exchange, B, a unit of account, and three, a store of value. So our U.S. dollars fiat currency uh, would satisfy arguably two of those three if you were to say that over a long period of time inflation erodes away the value of the dollar. Why would it be a store of value? Yeah, I, I tend to focus on just the commonly accepted medium of exchange. That's, I think, the standard definition of what makes something a money. Unit of account is a role that grows out of being the commonly accepted medium of exchange. That is, people post prices and keep their ledgers in the unit that they actually want to be paid in, and they expect to pay out, because that's the easiest way to transact and to get accurate uh, reckoning of your profits and losses. Store of value doesn't really identify anything about money. Any asset is a store of value. I mean, store of value just means asset. And so a money can be a better or a worse asset. It can be a better or a worse store of value. If it loses value rapidly, it's a worse store of value. Uh, okay. Uh, but well, but I, yeah. a money that's a bad store of value doesn't stop being a money. It just stops being a good money. Okay. Uh, do you believe that Bitcoin should even be on this list, given that you said that predictability is one of the things that you 
are, uh, you know, citing as one of your criteria. Bitcoin's price, one could argue, is a little yeah. bit unpredictable at times. So at this point, Bitcoin is not a commonly accepted medium of exchange. It is transacted. It is a medium of exchange. Some people do use it to buy things. Uh, but it hasn't become a commonly accepted medium of exchange for the reason you just identified, that the value is very volatile, which, you know, you'd be foolish to keep your rent money in Bitcoin if your rent is denominated in dollars, right? Your account value could go down 10% tomorrow and then you can't pay your rent. So people have shied away from using Bitcoin in everyday transactions or holding it in place of dollars for everyday transactions for good reason. And as I discuss in the book, I don't see any reason for that to change because the volatility is built into the design of Bitcoin, right? The Bitcoin is supplied according to a pre-announced schedule we know how many Bitcoin there are today and how many there are going to be next year and so on within small tolerances. There's only a little bit of wiggle room. And so all the burden of adjusting to changes in demand fall on the price of Bitcoin. There's no adjustment in the quantity in response to changes in demand. Uh, and that makes it a very volatile asset, especially since most of, most of the demand is speculative rather than a steadier demand to use it as a medium of payment. So there's a kind of a chicken and an egg problem. That is, if if it were established, if it were widely used as a payment medium, then it, its demand would be more stable, but it's hard to get there from here, here being the demand is almost entirely speculative. Now, I put Bitcoin in the lineup because people have proposed that it will become the world's money someday. And I'm saying uh, I don't see that being very likely. Now, other cryptocurrencies with a different design, they could possibly, a design that gives them a more stable purchasing power, they could possibly play a wider role. And of course, stable coins have grown to play a pretty substantial role uh, already. But a stable coin pegged to the dollar isn't any more stable than the US dollar. Uh, exactly. I mean, stable coin is just a electronic version or derivative of the U.S. dollar. Now, on the issue of dollar uh, versus Bitcoin, I think one of the things that people look at is this concept, this fuzzy concept of trust, a fiat currency by, it, it, you know, it, it's an issue, it's a currency by decree. It's the, the government has decreed this to be currency. So right. you have only the faith of the government to back that currency with. But essentially, you still have the U.S. dollar, you still have the world's arguably strongest economy, arguably strongest military, backing this currency up and fulfilling that faith. What is backing up Bitcoin? Well, I was going to say about the dollar, uh, what really backs it in the sense of supports its value is the, the trust people have that it won't be highly inflated. It, it doesn't depend on how strong the U.S. military is it depends on Federal Reserve policy. So you have to trust the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve has been rather inconsistent over the years. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, what you trust is that the release schedule won't be modified. So you know what the quantity is. That's what you can trust. But that doesn't give you reason to think that the purchasing power is going to be stable because the demand is not stable. Uh, this is a little bit out there, but it's difficult for a hacker to hack the Federal Reserve and print money <laughs> at their will. Uh, we call it counterfeiting, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, counterfeiting, but um, you know there are, there are measures we can take against counterfeiting. Now, we can't currently, some would argue, we can't currently hack the Bitcoin uh, system right now and, and, yeah. and uh, make it, uh, it's, it's immutable, so that, that's not going to change. Could that could that reverse at some point with the advent of stronger computers, quantum computing, for example? Is that a concern for you? Uh, that's not really a concern for me. Um, people have worried about, you know, the miners colluding to attack Bitcoin, but that wouldn't be in their interest to do. Uh, so far, it's proven uh, hack proof. And pe there are people who worry that in the long run, as the reward model for Bitcoin changes, so currently, most of the reward for mining a block is the, the new Bitcoin that's released on schedule, and only a little bit of it is 
transaction fees. But at some date, 100 years from now, there will be no more Bitcoin created. So it will be all transaction fees. And people worry that that might not be enough to get enough miners to keep the system secure. That's a pretty distant worry. Uh, in my, the discussion in my book, I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about the problem of purchasing power volatility. Is, trans Wait. is physical transportability of money an important criteria for you in, in evaluating its worthiness as money? Uh, not anymore. Not since we invented banks and invented remote payment, uh, electronic payment, wire transfers, uh, and so on. Uh, well, actually, just paper digits do the trick if you want to make a payment and can do it by deposit transfer. Then you don't have to lug around gold coins or silver coins. Then physical portability is not really an issue anymore. Well, that was one of the arguments against gold. From you know, I've watched a lot of these gold versus Bitcoin. Yeah, but you don't. Was, yeah. People in the in 1900 did not make payments by lugging around bags of gold coins. They made bank transfers. The transfers were of claims to gold on trusted banks. So that solves the portability problem. So then what ultimately is the conclusion from your book, uh, gold, fiat, or Bitcoin? How do you compare those three? W what's your evaluation on their money worthiness? Well, um, if you look at the actual performance of the gold standard and compare it to the actual performance of fiat standards, you'd have to say the gold standard is more reliable. But that doesn't mean we're going to go back to it anytime soon. There are a lot of political economy barriers to it. If you think about people from the bottom up deciding to put themselves on a new money, uh, there's an obstacle, which is the incumbent has a big advantage just by being an incumbent. And so the new money has to be not just better, but a lot better to make it worth going through that trouble. We do see people switch spontaneously when the local currency is really bad. In really high inflation countries, people put themselves on the dollar standard or the Euro standard, they dollarize or they Euroize. But for people to put themselves back on the gold standard uh, seems unlikely unless even the best fiat currencies start inflating at 20% or more. What, why, why is it unlikely? Why I've heard that before. Why is, is it unlikely that, let's take the US for example, that the US yeah. will revert back to a gold standard today or in the future? Well, I think uh, we learned from Jimmy Carter's administration that the uh, the president will be kicked out if there's double digit inflation. And so the message gets to the Fed, don't let that happen. And we saw that the Fed was surprised when inflation hit 9%. And then they very rapidly became serious about bringing inflation down uh, and very rapidly raised interest rates, which created a whole set of side effects. Uh, but I, I guess I, I trust in the political system uh, to keep the dollar from double-digit inflation anytime soon. Okay. What is the future of money going to look like in Europe? I that's a very broad question. I'll keep it open-ended. Yeah, well, we're fighting about that now. I mean, the big thing on the horizon is central bank digital currency. And that's an effort to substitute public sector money for private sector money. So it has me concerned because the public sector is not very good at doing the other functions of banking. And I don't expect them to be very good at doing retail payments. So that would be, uh, I think, inefficient, not to mention the surveillance concerns we would all have if our bank accounts were all in the books of the Federal Reserve System, a federal agency, instead of uh, under at, at private banks, which We'll give up information to the feds if they're asked, but at least the feds don't have real-time access to monitor people's accounts. Functionally speaking, what is the functional difference between a Fed coin, a CBDC for the United States, and just the U.S. dollar fiat currency? Well, it's an electronic version. Uh, so the Federal Reserve note is a paper claim on the Fed. Uh, it, it's a claim to nothing in, in effect, <laughs> but it's a claim to bank reserves and therefore your bank will take it at face value. And a CBDC, uh, either in token form or in account balance form, is a different kind of claim uh, on the Federal Reserve that doesn't have a physical counterpart. It just has an electronic counterpart.
but but this is a problem for us how i mean that the surveillance issue aside is it a yeah. superior form of money well i don't expect a superior form to come from the public sector any more than i expect superior package delivery from the u.s post office uh, so we have digital currency we have venmo right we have wechat pay alipay paytm under different names in different countries, the private sector is already providing digital currency. Moving all that to the central bank and making it a liability of the central bank is what the CBDC project is about. Uh, and, and in no way do I see it technically superior. What, what I'm wondering as an ordinary citizen is whether or not I will, or how I will adopt CBDCs in my own life. Will it be forced on me by decree Will all my well, salaries be paid through CBDCs, or is it just another form that I could adopt? That, that's also under debate. So some people who call for CBDC says, no, no, of course, we'll continue to give people the option to use Federal Reserve notes. Um, others say, no, no, the whole point is to eliminate paper currency so that we can have more surveillance and so that we can do macroeconomic policy in a way where we're not constrained by the so-called zero lower bound on interest rates, which is enforced by people having the option to move to paper currency, which pays zero, if the Fed tries to institute negative interest rates. How, how is it, well, how's it gonna work? So, so, so there's currently roughly, I don't know, two to two and a half trillion dollars of USD in circulation worldwide. Is the plan to digitize all of that that's in circulation into a CBDC or issue new money supply that is a CBDC? Yeah, that's a very good question because that, that is a big interest-free loan to the federal government from the rest of the world. And to withdraw all those $100 bills would be quite an undertaking because a lot of people overseas who can use $100 bills quite easily would have a hard time getting access to a central bank digital currency in the form of a deposit balance at the Fed because they would need online access to the Fed and they you know, might be unhappy to go through the uh, know your customer requirements that the Fed would impose. Uh, it, so it would be difficult for them. Uh, so at least in the short run, it would probably not be in the interest of the Treasury to um, convert all the paper dollars into digital dollars. So you talked about how you think it's unlikely the U.S. will go back to a gold-backed currency system. What about other countries? There's been some speculation talks that the uh, BRICS countries are looking into this. Certainly Russia has stated an, an, an interest more so than the other BRICS nations. Do you think that's a likely path forward for them? It's a possibility, and uh, the Gulf Coast Council countries have, have talked about it too. Uh, the U.S. dollar has done a couple of things to make it less attractive as an international payment medium. One is we had 9% inflation last year. And the other is we've been using censorship of the dollar payment rails to discipline Iran, Russia, other countries. Um, and so those other countries are naturally uh, going to look for a way to pay each other that doesn't require them to go through New York banks or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, whether they're going to adopt gold, uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, they could you know, adopt substitutes for the dollar, like create their own claims to dollars that could serve as a reserve medium. Well, let's, let's reframe the question a different way. Should they adopt gold as a currency backing, a common currency backing, given their strategic and perhaps geopolitical objectives? Well, if I had my druthers, the all, the whole world would go back on a gold standard and we would rec recreate an international gold standard. But the first move has to come from somebody. Uh, I mean, one possibility is there's a big new Bretton Woods conference at which all the participant countries say, you know, we've made a botch of fiat money, so let's go back to a gold standard. That I don't expect to happen, but it could be that uh, the BRICS countries or some other group decides to introduce a gold standard, it would give them a floating exchange rate against the dollar, which many countries avoid for obvious reasons. So it would have that cost, but it would help stabilize uh, the purchasing power of gold relative to the dollar, I think, by making more of the demand uh, 
a monetary demand rather than a speculative demand. So it could could happen. Okay. I mean, the, the Bretton Woods was uh, founded in the midst of World War II. The agreement was to stabilize right. international monetary conditions. I'm just speculating here. I'm not saying it needs to happen, but just based on that historical president, maybe we will we'll need to see some sort of global cl- conflict before everyone bands together and says, let's stabilize the monetary system again. That's unfortunately the case. It's in a crisis that it becomes possible to make big institutional changes. And nobody's hoping for a global financial crisis, but it's good to have a plan B on the shelf. Well, good points. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, where can we learn more about your work and your readings and your writings? Better money, gold fiat or Bitcoin on sale now. (laughs) Um, That would be the first uh, touch point. (laughs) Okay. I think you're also on Twitter, so we'll put the links down in the description to, I am, yeah. to your social media and also your book. Thank you very much for sharing uh, a synopsis of your book with us. I encourage everyone to click on the link below and read more to learn more from Professor White. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, David. Good to talk to you. Yeah, and thank you for watching to the audience. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe.